Good morning, good day, and good evening to all our attendees joining us today for the latest Data Science Central webinar. I'd like to first of all thank Tableau Software for sponsoring today's webinar. Tableau has been a longtime supporter of the Data Science Central community, and we are honored once again to have them sponsoring our event today, focusing on the category of visualization. I would also like to take this opportunity to mention and show our appreciation for some of our other recent sponsors, including EMC Greenplum, Alpine Data Labs, Hortonworks, and Splunk, to name just a few. These past webinars are available on demand at datasciencecentral.com, and if you have not had the opportunity to view them, I would encourage you to take a look as they do provide some great perspective and insight into our industry specific to the topics discussed. Today's webinar is entitled, The Five Most Influential Visualizations of All Time. Before we begin, I'd like to briefly review the format of today's webinar. Today's event will be one hour long. We will have a single panelist that I'll introduce to all of you in just a moment. We will have approximately 15 minutes of Q&A following the presentation. And as always, you can find this recorded event on datasciencecentral.com in about a week. I would also like to encourage our attendees to provide questions directly to me throughout the presentation. I will be reviewing them and presenting them on your behalf with the time remaining immediately following the presentation. My name is Tim Madison and I am one of the co-founders of Data Science Central and I will be your host for today's event. I'm very pleased to introduce today's presenter, Andy Cotgreave of Tableau Software. Hello everybody, great to be with you all. Thank you, Andy. Andy is Tableau Software's senior data analyst located in the UK. He brings more than 16 years experience utilizing business intelligence tools and he will be sharing with us today his perspective and expertise. In today's presentation, Andy will be sharing techniques pioneered in five specific examples of earlier infographics and visualizations that have made these the five most influential of all time. He will, be, he will be providing the details on what makes them so unique, as well as reasons why you may want to incorporate these basics into your presentation. So with that, Andy, I'm going to provide you with the access to begin your presentation. We're looking forward to it. And there you go. Okay. Well, let me just get my screen shared. And you want to see PowerPoint, not Tableau. Okay, well, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Andy Cotgreave, uh, and as uh, Tim said, I work for Tableau, uh, but I was a business analyst at the University of Oxford for a long time prior to that. Um, and it's, it's great to have you all on, on, the, on this webinar today. I'm really uh, grateful for you all spending time with me, uh, and I hope you get a great deal out of this session, because what this list of influential visualizations, what this session isn't, is a history lesson. I don't just want to show you a bunch of things that happened a long time ago, right? You know, if you are watching this session, what I want you to get out of this is techniques that you can apply to your work when you're doing data analysis at your desk, right? And that doesn't mean getting out pencils in the way they used to in the past and doing things by hand, but looking at the way challenges were faced before technology, and what we can learn from those is that those same challenges actually are really applicable today. So this isn't about history, or it's not a history lesson, it's about helping you to become a better data analyst. So at Tableau, I'm a product consultant and data analyst, but I'm also extremely lucky because I've essentially been paid to delve into the history of data visualization for courses we teach, and you know I've learned a great deal. It's been an amazing journey that I've had. So with that, let's crack on with the session. So we're going to look at five visualizations, and I'm making the bold claim that these are the most influential. What do I mean by influential? Well, I'm taking, in picking this short list, or this list, I try to look at this in two ways, influence in two ways. First of all, 
did the visualization influence the audience for which it was attended, intended? Because just think, when we're doing data visualizations, we are, if we're communicating those with other people, we want them to be able to take actionable insight and make decisions or change their behavior as a result of that visualization. The second aspect of influence is, well, what about the influence on data visualization as a field? You know, with tools like Tableau and other uh, visualization tools, you know, the techniques they use were not invented by the developers of those products. There's hundreds of years of history and academic research and experimentation and innovation that has gone towards informing what, what, it, what, what exists in the market and what is the cutting edge of data visualization. And that's something we're really keen at Tableau to, to be involved in. So what you're going to see is some amazing visits. We're going to learn aspects of visualization design and applicable things that we can put into our own work every day. So here is my framework, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. We're going to go through the list and then talk about what we can learn from each one of these visualizations. At number five is the John Snow cholera map from 1854. So imagine, maybe some of you are, imagine you are living in Soho in London in 1854. London is a thriving, growing city, amazing period to be in London. But there's a problem. London stinks. It is a filthy, dirty place because there's no uh, processing of waste uh, from toilets or wastewater. As a result of this, well, not only does London stink, but cholera is a serious, serious threat. And cholera in 1854 was deadly. We didn't realize that the, the way to survive cholera was just to drink water. People did not realize that that's how you could survive cholera. <coughs> so in Soho in August 1854, a water pump in the center of Broad Street became infected when somebody threw their child's um, basically waste into the water that fed that spring. That infected water was drunk by hundreds of people, and within 10 days, 500 people died. Just imagine that, if that happened on your block, wherever you live. 10 days, 500 people wiped out by what it turns out is a very survivable disease. So what this map shows is the uh, so let me, is where all the people who died where they lived. Uh, if I just zoom in again, the bar each individual black bar represents one death, and uh, John Snow stacked these so you could see households where many, many, many people died. And this map, I'll come on to the influence of this map uh, in a moment, but it's a very clear and early example of geospatial analysis showing where things happened in a way that makes you see very visually, oh my gosh, all of this was centered around the Broad Street water pump. John Snow, this is the man behind it, John Snow, he was a very, a, a very intelligent uh, and pioneering clinician. He did a lot of great development on um, anesthesia. He was actually the first person to put Queen Victoria under anesthetic, so that was quite a claim to fame. But he also was going against the grain. In 1854, Pete, Society thought cholera was spread by miasma, which is another word for dirty air. They thought it was an airborne disease. John Snow realized that it must be a waterborne disease, because why didn't everybody in a single household die from cholera? It was where they got their water from. But he needed to come up with a paradigm shift to change the way the world saw cholera. Now, there are a bunch of myths about the John Snow cholera map. Um, it's a very, very famous map. I expect a lot of you have, uh, have seen the map before. But some myths p p uh, continue about this map. Jon Snow had the data, and with the data, convinced the authorities to remove the handle of the water pump on Broad Street. As a result of that handle being removed, the epidemic ended. But it was not the map that convinced the authorities to remove the water pump. The map came later. And in fact, another myth was that well, John Snow wasn't even the first person to draw a map of deaths of that outbreak. This is another map made about a month earlier, uh, using the same data and trying to convey the well, convey a similar thing. So, if there are myths about the map and it didn't mean the handle was removed because of the map, well, why is this an influential visualization? Well, to go back to our two criteria for influence, in the first instance, this the audience 
that this was intended for was the people reviewing what had happened at the outbreak in Soho in August 1854. He went with this map in October, so a few months later, saying, look, this is where the people who lived died, and this is which water pump they were drinking from. Now, as a result of this map and Jon Snow's passion and communication and dedication to his new knowledge, that was when the view turned, and the world began to realize that cholera was a waterborne disease. And then, as a result of that, London undertook an amazing engineering project, and we now have in London, well, it's now a bit outdated, but we have an amazing sewage system. And cholera is a thing of the past in, in uh, sort of more developed cities. So that was the influence on society. Uh, and this is a very famous map. You see this in lots of data visualization textbooks because it's a great way of showing, look, this is what people would do. People realized that you needed to see the geospatial distribution in order to understand some of these relationships. Now, what's great is uh, if you ever come to London, I recommend that you do, and you can be a data visualization tourist. It's not a big industry, but if you go to Broad Street, which is now called Broadwick Street, they actually have the water pump on Broadwick Street as a tribute, and the pub in the background of this pic picture is the Jon Snow pub. So in the interest of data visualization, uh, the history behind uh, what we do in our job, I invite you all to London and uh, to go and have a pint in this fine pub. Uh, I've done that plenty of times. Number four. So this visualization is showing the power of something called guided analytics, or animated storytelling. And, and really the importance of the being passionate about the data. And I mean you as authors and visualizers and people trying to communicate things, you need to be passionate about your data. Because I think your success and our success as visualization designers or dashboard designers or analysts trying to share results is about us being dedicated to communicating and getting these results in people's faces and getting them to understand the results because a dashboard alone probably won't do that. So at number four, this is uh, the, a more recent visualization. And it's the Gapminder charts from Hans Rosling, um, for, made, made famous in uh, Hans Rosling's amazing TED talk from 2006, gosh, six years ago, seven years ago almost. Now, we don't have the uh, ability really to show this video right now. If you haven't seen this video, then I implore you at the end of this session to not start your working day or finish your working day, but go and watch this TED video. It is one of the most amazing uh, TED talks you could ever see, and it's all about data. I've watched it hundreds of times. What you will find uh, if you go and see this is that not only is uh, Rosling's or are Rosling's charts amazing, what they're showing is how uh, fertility and development of different regions of the world has changed over time. And Hans Rosling created these charts because he was driven by a passion where he wanted to convince people that the developing world was not such a basket case that everybody thought. These charts show that actually a lot of third world countries, as they might have been called, actually they're a lot better than people might realize. And what Hans Rosling does in this TED talk, and whenever he talks about data, is animate the, well, he animates the data in the visualization, but he commentates the story. He talks through the story of the data as it changes, and he talks like it's a, a football or a soccer commentary, you know, so he, he brings drama and tension and guides people into particular views of uh, the visualization as they, as they come. And, you know, I think, well, what, what is it? I mean, as soon as you've seen this visualization, you'll, you'll kind of grasp the amazingness about what he does. And what is it that Hans Rosling does? And you know, wouldn't it be great if you could kind of do something like this and add things like to your dashboard? So this, what we're looking at here is a, uh, the dashboard designer section of Tableau software. You know, and so you can put images and text and sheets on there. But what if you could put Hans Rosling onto your dashboard? Right? What would that do? Well, it would add to any standard dashboard. You, know, you could add Hans Rosling to this dashboard, right? And, and he would talk through the data, he would animate the story and really guide you through this and draw you in. Well, unfortunately, that is not a feature we're working on in Tableau. We are not going to put Hans Rosling in our dashboards, but it, I think it's really important to take away from what he does that actually you can do the same thing. 
even if you don't want to, don't have an opportunity to stand in front of your dashboard, you can try and create guided analytics in your dashboard, really vivid instructions, highlight certain areas of concerns, use KPIs, annotations, and tool tips to help people to say, look, when you're looking at this chart, what you need to do is focus on these marks here, or look, this mark is going wrong, something's not working. And then, right, so that's the dashboard itself, but then it is up to us as analysts to also not just rely on the publication of a dashboard being the thing that will drive change. You know, if you're creating, doing data analysis, you should be, you're doing it for a reason, and I think that part of the process is to add the human aspect to data visualization and dashboards and say, here's my dashboard and I need to be in front of this with you so I can talk about it and we can do extra analysis because I care about what we're trying to achieve as data analysts. At number three, um, this visualization is, uh, I guess, the gateway drug to data visualization in, in the field itself. Um, a lot of people in a lot of companies, they kind of understand the value and the uh, purpose of data visualization, but sometimes there's resistance uh, within other parts of the business or managers. Uh, you know, they're just happy with their tables of numbers and they don't see the value of adding extra visual aspects to their data. And I think uh, this visualization is very famous, but it really encapsulates how you can see things differently with data. So the chart is uh, based in 1812, Napoleon's march to Moscow. Uh, he marched to Mon Moscow to conquer the city, but it was a disaster. Uh, this, this chart encapsulates what happened. Basically, 98% of uh, Napoleon's soldiers died, only 2% of the so soldiers survived. And maybe this chart is the right thing to show that data. Well, maybe not. Right. This is not the chart that's at number three. This is a pie chart which effectively shows 2% and 98%. Let's have a look at what the real chart is. I expect a lot of you have uh, seen this chart before. This is uh, Charles Minard's March on Moscow, from uh, which he drew in 1869. For those of you who haven't seen it before, it is a graphical representation of what happened when Minard went to Moscow. He, if I, he started over on the left-hand side, um, that's the border of Russia, with about 400,000 soldiers. The light brown bar is the route, or a, a, a graphical representation of the route he took to Moscow. By the time he got to Moscow, he'd already lost most of his uh, soldiers. Nothing really happened in Moscow, much, uh, well, nothing was successful really happened, so he had to retreat. And that black line beneath the brown line is the uh, map of the retreat. And you can see that by the time he got back to the same place he'd started, he had less than 10,000 able-bodied soldiers left. So a cat catastrophic campaign uh, changed the course of history in Europe. Visually represented here with uh, latitude, longitude, number of soldiers. The line at the bottom shows the temperature during the retreat. It was a bitterly cold winter. You can see where hundreds of soldiers fell in a river about uh, two-thirds of the way through the retreat. It's a really vivid, vivid story of the disastrous march on Moscow. Now I'm going to talk about influence and appropriateness of this visualization in a moment, but I think it's worth focusing on Charles Minard because uh, he wasn't a visualized a person who did visualization by trade, he was an engineer, but he came to visualization late in his life. Uh, he was the first person to put pie charts on maps. As we can see here, this is showing the source of meat sold in Parisian markets. Uh, not, I forget what year that is from, I'm afraid. Uh, or this chart, which, which is actually a really good chart. This is showing the flow of coal, exports of coal from the UK uh, to the rest of the world. Um, what I really like about this chart, and I think it's a really interesting thing to take away, is that if you look at the flow that goes into the Mediterranean, that's obviously where most of the coal is going. And what Minard's realized here is that the data is more important than geographical accuracy. So the big bar shows me that lots of coal is going to the Mediterranean. But if you then look at the geography of Africa or the Spanish Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal, Minard has squished that completely because that's kind of secondary. You don't need an accurate representation of the geography in order to understand the data. And you know that's a key thing. When you're trying to make a chart, what are you trying to communicate? Do you always need everything else? 
themselves to be uh, as visible or as accurate? In this case, the answer is no. Geography was not, you know, the actual uh, coastlines were not that important. But let's just reflect on this pie chart because Minard's uh, chart, his his uh, map, is so famous, made famous by Tufty to about 25 years or 30 years ago, that it's actually now started coming in for a lot of criticism. A lot of people say, "Oh, it's not the most appropriate way to show the data. It's a long-winded visualization. Surely something like a pie chart or a bar chart is more appropriate." Now, I have two answers to that. First of all. My experience is the first time people see Menard's chart or Menard's map is that they are knocked out by it. People who don't get data visualization are shown Menard's map and they're like, wow, now I understand why data visualization is important. So that's a really key part of it. And then the second part of why I think those criticisms are wrong is that people are not mindful of who Menard's audience was. He, he made this map in 1869. That was pre-internet, pre-television, pre-technology. So back in those days, people had a long attention span. They were used to sitting down and reading and spending time looking at something. So in those days, people would be perfectly happy to sit and digest this information over, you know, over many minutes or hours if they wished to. 21st century, we've all got short attention spans. And if we're trying to communicate something fast, if I was doing the chart in a PowerPoint presentation like I'm doing now, and I just wanted to make one point about the data, that maybe this pie chart is more appropriate. But really for me, this is a, a, an amazing chart that shows why data visualization is really powerful. So that's why it's influential in terms of data viz. <laughs> Did it change the world? Well, Menard made this as a, an anti-war post. I hit the world was going to war again in 1869, and he wanted to be like, look, haven't we learned that war is a waste? And Unfortunately, it will take more than just a chart to stop humanity uh, going to war at the drop of a hat. So it didn't really influence society, but its influence on data visualization is, uh, I think, unarguable. Which brings us to number two. A lot of visualization experts rightly say you should always use the most appropriate visualization, and we have scores and you know decades of research and academics what are, what are the most appropriate visualizations but importantly the most important thing about visualization is to get your message across if you're trying to make a point if you're trying to make change if you're trying to make decisions then the way in which you engage users and communicate the point you're trying to make that surely has to be most important all right so this chart is uh, Florence Nightingale's uh, area diagrams, or the map of the mortal mortality in Crimean War in uh, 1856. So 1856, uh, Britain and France and the Ottoman Empire went to war with Russia. Now, the Crimean War is famous for some major tactical disasters, uh, but it's also famous for Florence Nightingale um, revolutionizing the way nursing was taken. She went and cleaned up the battlefield hospitals. Now, when she came back from the Crimean War, having you know, made this massive change in uh, nursing, the, the approach to nursing, she was also uh, then asked to contribute to a royal commission to help the government understand why, what, what they should do to stop so many soldiers dying. So what this chart shows, and it was published in the Royal Commission in 1858, is how soldiers died in the Crimean War. The blue bar represents the number of soldiers that died of curable diseases. The black bar, or segments, show how many died on the battlefield, and the pink bars are how many died in other, by other causes. Now, what is therefore amazingly clear from this is most, the biggest segments are blue. The point being, more, more soldiers died in hospitals than anywhere else. Now, we look back on that and think, well, God, how we, you know, if, if that was the situation today, that would just be horrific. But maybe people hadn't seen that information. And so this map was used to make her point very vividly in this Royal Commission. It's like, look, soldiers die in hospitals. This is a disaster and preventable and changeable. Let's go and change the way we look after soldiers in hospitals, which is what happened as a result of the Royal Commission and Florence Nightingale's work. Now, 
I'll come back to the right or wrongs of this chart because again it's another chart that is very often discussed uh, in terms with with a modern eye. But before I do, I want to talk a little bit about Florence Nightingale. She was, I mean, she's she's famous for her nursing. You know, that that's why Florence Nightingale um, made her name. But she was all her life was an amazing stato. She loved data uh, throughout her life. She she was basically a quantified self. She kept information about herself throughout her life. She kept records, she was a letter writer, she kept information, and she always had this eye for numbers. And one thing I really love about this story in this particular chart is that when she was doing this, creating these charts uh, for the Royal Commission, she was working with this gentleman here, is uh, William Farr, who was an amazing guy who changed the way data was collected and uh, changed the way the world looked at stat statistics in Victorian England. Now, he being a Victorian gentleman, he was very traditional, and he would say, well, people, he was a bit like Thomas Gradgrind from um, Hard Times in, in Pickens. You know, people need to see the facts, and only the facts, therefore, people, we should only ever draw tables, because pictures are frivolous and frilly, whereas the numbers are what could the answer. And she was like, no, that's not right. We need to aggregate and visualize this data in order for people to see what it means. Tables are not sufficient. So she actually overrode him, which was a bit of a controversial decision, and made sure these these images, these charts, were in the report. You know, and you ask me, you tell me, well, you can't tell me because you're all on mute, but, you know, would, if this was a table of numbers, would it have as big an impact? I would suggest not. Now, this is another visualization that suffers uh, in the modern society by people criticizing the radial nature of the time series and the area and the different segments, right? And again, so, yeah, sure, this is not best practice, but I actually think those criticisms are wrong again. Because, yes, I can't easily tell you whether there were more deaths in August than November in 1855. There are two of the segments on the right hand side. A bar chart would make that a lot easier, or a line chart. But that wasn't Florence Nightingale's point. Her point was to say, Blue is bigger than black. And she did it in this way. She didn't have uh, books about how to visualize data at, at her uh, back and call. She only had this way of doing it. And she, so she came up, she started with a pen and paper and a compass, I guess, and drew this because she had the passion and the drive to just get the data visually representative in whatever way she knew would work. So again, the criticisms, I say, are unfair. And finally, we come to what I think is the most influential visualization of all time. This encapsulates everything you should be striving for as a visual analyst. Innovation, originality, a wide audience, and a big impact uh, on your audience. And it's actually one that isn't very famous. It's the chart of biography by a man called Joseph Priestley from 1765. This is a very uh, hard to see picture because it's quite small and blurred. Each one of those marks, right, so the, the x-axis along the bottom of this chart represents two and a half thousand years of human, or of humanity, human philosophical development, right? And each mark represents a famous person's lifespan. Uh, so each one is a little black bar with a certain length representing their name. Each one is labeled. What was Joseph Priestley trying to do here? He was trying to take this massive humanity and all this amazing thinking and all these amazing people and say, well, when, were the, when did they all live? What category of people were they in? That's the y-axis. And who lived long and, you know, what can we see? Where were the, um, at what stages in human, human development were we thriving in thinking? Where were the, what were the dark ages? And that's what this chart, which was a really big format and designed to be printed on a wall, encapsulated. You can see the big picture or you can literally zoom in and look at individual marks to find individual people. Uh, this shot is a, a much smaller version he did to try and show the point. Um, there's only about 50 names on here. And you can see uh, a couple of nice innovations here. The, bar, the length of the bar represents uh, how long each person lived. As you can see, some of them have dots. Uh, so where there's dots, that represents where the year of birth or the year of death is unsure. So he's, he was trying to encode uncertainty in the data. There was another great couple of in innovations that he did with this, because simultaneously he 
uh, made this chart, which was a new chart of history. The, ex the, 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 printed, the printout of this is exactly the same size as the chart of biography, and the x-axis is exactly the same time span. So what we can see here in, now is the growth and decline of certain empires and uh, groups of humans uh, throughout that same time period. But what was cool was that what he was doing was creating interactive dashboards because he designed this so you could put it side by side and see how things looked at in terms of this categorization or you could put them one on top of the other and see left to right how did things happen over time you know what actually you know what what thinkers were alive during the growth and height of particular empires so he he made some pretty good innovations and I'm going to talk about why this is the most information influential chart in a moment but this is a bit of a history lesson because the life of Joseph Priestley is amazing. Not many people have heard of him. He's not, um, well, maybe a lot of people, maybe some of you have heard of him. This is Joseph Priestley. Uh, he started his life uh, as a teacher and created some of these amazing visualizations. But then he went and did, he did so much great stuff in his life. He went and studied uh, everything about er the early knowledge about electricity. He was a great friend of Marconi. And he wrote a textbook which became the definitive electrical textbook for about 100 years. Then he went uh, and in his back shed, in his back garden, he did experimentation his whole life. He discovered carbon dioxide and discovered carbonated water. So Joseph Priestley was the man who enabled us to have Coke, Pepsi, soda water. Carbon dioxide was one thing. Then he went on and discovered oxygen. Uh, he didn't realize it was oxygen. It was somebody else who kind of had to point the way. But his experiments isolated and proved the existence of oxygen. Also, he was a fairly controversial religious figure. Uh, his writings were always controversial, and ultimately there were a bunch of riots in Birmingham in England, so big they got these paintings drawn about them, and he exiled himself to the US, where he made friends such as, uh, you know, your founding, the American founding fathers, such as Thomas Jefferson. So an amazing polymath. Um, alive and at a great period of uh, human uh, or social development. And, you know, many influences on society came from uh, Joseph Priestley, but one of which was visualization. So given I'm claiming this is the most influential, I need to uh, try and justify that. Well, why was this the most influential work? Well, there were a bunch of really good innovations on this chart. He was one of the first people to use a consistent x-axis to represent time. We take that for granted. When we draw a chart in Excel or Tableau or whatever application we use, well, x-axis, time goes along the, along the x-axis. But people haven't worked that out 250 years ago. Somebody had to be the first person to do that. This work was also designed to be printed and put on the walls and be read by hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. And you know, certainly we know that uh, Florence Nightingale knew and enjoyed this chart. Her father had it in, her li in his library. Uh, and there are other examples of the influence. This is uh, from this is a page from a book written by Charles Darwin's grandmother. Now she was a big pioneer in the education of women, and you know what this highlighted segment basically says: you know we need to get women in, uh, if we're going to put them in boarding schools. Girls need to have the history of biography, biography, and the history of uh, uh, empires on walls so that we can educate people. Because this child was seen by thousands and thousands and thousands of people, so it's certainly influenced what lots of them did and saw and understood about history. But the reason it's really at number one for me is because of this quote. It's now 16 years since I first thought of applying line to subject to finance. Was I the first to apply Priestley's principles to finance? Somebody had seen Priestley's work and applied those to charts themselves. Now this person, the person who said this was William Playfair, who again I suspect many of you uh, will know his a familiar name. This is uh, Playfair's chart on Denmark, Norway imports exports from 1786. This is the first printed statistical line chart. So this chart was an amazing innovation at the time, and this chart might not have existed had Priestley not laid the right foundations for Playfair to come up with this chart. Now this chart is amazing because you look at that and it's got almost all the traits of a good modern visualization. You would not do badly if you created a chart like this today. It's annotated. It's got grid lines to help us uh, see where the relevant things are. The coloring is subtle. It's not uh, overbearing. 
there's a nice title, there's a caption, there's a data source. You know, this is this is a great chart. And that's amazing because Playfair kind of got it right uh, all those years ago, what, 250 years ago. So we have seen five visualizations, Snow, uh, Rosling, Nightingale, Minard, and Priestley. Well, these are all old, you know, these are all hand-drawn or hand-coded, and I'll, I'll specify that. But what about modern BI tools? I thought I'd just take a break here and say, how might we do these charts in a modern BI tool? Uh, would we do them the same? Can we even get the data? So what I'm going to do is switch to Tableau, which is my visualization tool of choice. And let's see how, how well or badly I managed to do these charts. I have a USB device. Not like a Sorry about that. So let's take them in order. John Snow, uh, somebody did uh, deco encode the data. And I actually don't think I got as good a result here. I can animate where all the deaths appeared. The red cross is the infected water pump and the black dots are where everybody died, basically. So we can see over time this kind of animation builds up. You know, so we can add animation in a way that Jon Snow never did, but you know what, is this really better than what Jon Snow drew? I'm not entirely sure it is, personally. So I'm going to give uh, Jon Snow the win there. Hans Rosling, he hand-coded, uh, or he uh, he basically, um, I, I, well, I, I don't know how he developed the Gantminder, actually, but he, he made a really smooth piece of software, some great animation, and yes, with modern tools, we can do this. Here, I've got uh, South Sudan highlighted, and we can do the animation as well. Uh, you know, so we, we can create the Hans Rosling stuff, and the, what, what, what's great about Gatmind data is that all of this is downloadable, and we can create a similar kind of uh, view to see to see exactly what was going on. So we could, you know, this is South Africa. We can see the change in life expectancy and fertility. Again, this is within our grasp. Charles Minard. Well, actually, uh, it wasn't me. This, this was uh, this visualization was done by uh, a woman called Kim Reese from Periscopic in Portland, in Washington. And again, what's great about the data is essentially it's just uh, number of soldiers on a map with latitude and longitude. So yes, yeah, very much this should be something that uh, a lot of tools can do. We can put nice titles and fonts on there. Florence Nightingale, well, Tableau doesn't do radial charts. Uh, and many people would say you shouldn't do radial charts. But to those people, I'd say, well, does this look as, does this have as much impact? Does this chart engage you in the same way that rose the uh, Florence Nightingale's diagram does? Now, I actually think this doesn't look, you know, Florence Nightingale's chart is more of an impact, has more of an impact. And sometimes as data analysts, we do need to have more of an impact than we do be pure, purely functional about the exact appropriate visualization type for the data. You know, because making change, making decisions is a key requirement of what we're trying to do. Joseph Priestley, well, essentially this is Joseph Priestley's chart is a Gantt chart. Um, which means, uh, you know, Gantt charts are easily doable in Tableau and other tools. Uh, the only problem I had is that I could not get the data. All the data is available on uh, on a Google archive. This is a screenshot from one page. We can see, you know, that's all the data that's in John Snow's book, but I have not managed to do an OCR program on this. If anybody wants to do that and digitize this data, I would love to be able to visualize it in Tableau. And finally, uh, Priestley inspired Playfair. and what I really like about the Playfair chart is that when we look at that chart in Tableau, this chart looks very, very similar to the way Playfair got it, which means Playfair just nailed it that first time in 1786. And even in the 21st century with modern tools, I maybe wouldn't choose to do it in any different way. We could do it in different ways, but I think he got it right, right there. So let's go back to the this list um, you know, yes yes we can mostly do these things in modern tools and now let's uh, bring this to a close and I'll, I'll summarize exactly what um, 
what this means for us as data analysts. Before I do, I would love to have this debate online with you. Uh, I'm on Twitter. I'm A. Cotgreave on Twitter. Please tweet me. Tell me if you agree, disagree, or think I've got it completely wrong. I'd love to know. Uh, if you want some more information, at the end of this, uh, a bit.ly five visits. There's some resources about each of these because there's some great further reading to do about each of these uh, visualizations. But to summarize, what can we learn from these charts? Well, what I learned in researching this session and delivering it is that an individual visualization itself is often not the thing that creates influence. It's the people who create influence. Because a visualization does not really cannot be expected to live and create impact on its own. Each one of these people had a simple, or well, maybe a complex, but they had a drive. They wanted to change things for the better. They had the data, and they wanted to go and communicate that data to the world. And that, and, and, and what for me is so special about these visualizations is that they don't have Tableau, they don't have Excel, they don't have tools that can create axes or color legends or size legends or time series or line charts or tree maps automatically. Every one of these people had to essentially hand code and hand and decide every last bit of this design. You know, so when, when Priestley is making this Gantt chart, he had to decide which colors to use. Is it worth using color? How expensive is it used to, color, to use color? What does this color add to my chart? And I think that's one thing we could all do, take away from this, is sometimes instead of just battling through and creating charts without giving any thought, is take a step back and think, well, if I only had a pen and paper and all this data, how would I draw this visualization? What, different, what decisions would I make if it was expensive in terms of time or ink to make this chart? So that's one key takeaway. But the other one is that when you're doing your visualizations and exploring data, whatever the volume is, it's up to you to put the passion and the drive into the visualization and then try and help the, use the visualizations to help inform and educate others and take actionable insights as a result of that. So with that, I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, I hope that has been interesting and entertaining. Uh, I hope you've all learned something uh, and I thank you very much for your time and now we'll uh, switch over to some Q&A. Mm -hmm. Excuse me Andy, thank you so much. That was a wonderful, wonderful presentation and just you know, truly fascinating just to hear the history. What I find really interesting is just that it's uh, still so applicable to today. Absolutely. So we do have time for some Q&A. Give me just a moment here to Make this transfer back. There we go. Um, so during your presentation, Andy, I was uh, taking some notes on the questions that were coming in. I want to thank the audience for being so interactive and once again uh, providing some really good questions. There seem to be a few different themes that were coming in, but I think it just makes sense to start with one of the most basic questions. Uh, so Andy, one of them was, uh, I think a perfect starting point is, what really makes a truly quality chart? Uh, a truly quality chart, well that is a, a fundamental question. I, I, I think, to me, uh, you know, some people might argue it's a, a truly quality chart is one that obeys all laws about the best practice of data visualization, right? And that is largely true, but I think a true quality chart can be measured on the success of its ability to educate, inform the audience for which it is made. So when you make a chart, you need to either do usability tests or ask yourself, does this chart communicate my message in the most effective way? And the most effective way will be determined by how much data you have, who your audience is, and what message you're trying to make. You know, every, every chart there's an agenda of some sort behind every chart, right? And some audiences are well educated in data visualization. Some of them are just looking at a newspaper and want a bit of information and a bit of entertainment while they read facts about the news. Mm -hmm. So it's trying to balance and achieve the best effect for the for the audience for your visualization. 
if you get that right, then you have a successful chart. Right. Makes sense. Uh, thanks for that, Andy. Uh, the next question is, it seems that all except for uh, one of the visualizations shown seem to be rather you know, old. Uh, are there any influential visualizations from the last few years that you might be able to show or discuss? Uh, well, I probably can't show them. I certainly can discuss them. Uh, I think that you know the data visualization is hot, right? You know, it is a hot topic. Um, lots of tools are about the doing data visualization extremely well. There's lots of great websites. It's a really big business. Data science is a huge growth area. Uh, but I think with it, are the more are there many influential visualizations from recent times? I, it's difficult to know. I think we, we're going to have to wait a few years. Uh, obviously, you know something that came out just the other week. I couldn't tell you that was influential, but you know the, the shining lights like Hans Gapminder. I think it, its impact in just six years has been huge. You know, Hans Rosling is now a well-respected, uh, much lauded presenter and uh, innovator in statistics. He's very passionate. You know, with TV programs, so. I, I think the answer to the question is an interesting one to answer because there's loads of amazing visualizations that I see that get lots of uh, hits and get lots of um, a really big audience, but I think it's too early to say whether they're influential. Uh, Gapminder certainly is, and it, the other ones, other ones are more debatable. Right. Well, it sounds like time will tell. Absolutely. Uh, the next question here is, how can I apply what I've learned today to my own data visualizations? Have some recommendations. Uh, yeah. So, how would you apply it to your own visualizations? Well, I think I kind of touched on that at the end. Um, you know, tools today make it really easy for you to do anything and to make any chart, and they make it really easy for you to make a thousand charts in about ten minutes. You know, something with like Tableau, you can just drag and drop things around and make a new chart, 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 and that's brilliant because that sort of takes away a lot of the burden. You know, that's why technology is amazing. It makes things that were hard a lot easier. But then the price of that is, well, it, well, the, the benefit of that is that you can get to the answers quicker in many cases. But the price of that is sometimes you lose sight or awareness of why, you're do, why, why Tableau or why, why your visualization tool is doing what it's doing. You know, why did it, why did I end up with a bar chart? Why should I do a bar chart here, or should it be a circle chart, or a map, or a line series, or 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 even a pie chart? Mm -hmm. And and I think what you can learn from today is if you put yourself in the mind of people who literally only have a piece of pen and paper, you know. So well, so when they draw something, they need to get it right. A because it's going to take them time to do it, and B because uh, it's going to take a long time. They need to get it right. So Stepping back and putting yourself in the eyes of somebody without technology, I think it's something you, we could all benefit from doing sometimes when we make charts. Very good. Makes makes sense. Uh, we'll wrap up with this last question then, Andy. Um, does big data change the way we would create visualizations today? So does big data change the way we do visualizations today? Uh, I'd say not really. Um, with Big data, we have the ability to put thousands and thousands and thousands of data points on a map or, or on a chart. Uh, um, but you saw with Joseph Priestley, he put thousands of data points on his chart 300 years ago, and he did it by hand. I mean, you know, fair play to him. Uh, I wouldn't like to do that by hand today. But even with big data, even though the data might be in strange places, might be stored in strange ways and unstructured, I think a lot of the questions we ask of data are still exactly the same. You know, we're trying to find out. You know, in in business, we're trying to find out how can I make more profits, how can I be more efficient, how can I successfully sell to more customers, right. and whether your data is, you know, a six thousand row Excel file or a ten petabyte eBay teradata table with every single transaction, the questions those businesses people are asking are still the same. Uh, you know, so generally, I think the questions are st the same, so the charts need to be the same. We just have the ability to aggregate at a much higher volume. Right. Well, that makes sense. Well, Andy, thank you again. There were some uh, very informative answers to, I think, some some great questions. Uh, for those of you that had asked some questions that have not been answered today, rest assured, 
I will be sending all the questions to Andy and Tableau, allowing them to follow up with you directly uh, following today's webinar. I have just a few quick announcements that to please mark your calendars for April 23rd and our next Data Science Central webinar on the topic of combining big data and enterprise data to improve your business performance. This one will be sponsored by LavaStorm. Also, just a reminder that this event is being taped and you can find it in about a week on the homepage of datasciencecentral.com, located in the video section just on the lower right-hand side. Uh, so this brings today's webinar to a close. I'd like to thank our audience for their attendance and thoughtful questions. Thank you to Andy and to Tableau for their sponsorship and insight into today's topic. My name is Tim Madison. I'm very pleased to have been your host and moderator for today's event, and I will look forward to seeing you all again in April.